Yesterday, Apple showed you how to be a Snoopy character. I'm my cave Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you and if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like the video, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, ba 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 ba, we're done. So we've got a bunch of cool stories for you today and then we will be answering more of your questions in iCave Answers a little bit further on in the video. But let's get straight into it. Yesterday, today Apple taught you how to draw yourself as a Peanuts character in 10 minutes. Um, it was an interesting thing. I don't know particularly why, but they decided to use pages as the, uh, the canvas for this on the iPad. Uh, I think probably because it's a free app and everyone gets the option of using it, but it also gave them the chance to display a couple of the extra features like the collaborate on documents things where they were collaborating in real time between the guys that were uh, on on Skype or probably FaceTime more likely um, actually running the session. And it was basically an Apple Store retail employee plus a storyboard artist from Snoopy, Krista Porter, who guides you through the process to create your own. Now, it's not super easy, but I'm pretty happy with mine and uh, I've time-lapsed it because even though it's a 10-minute video and I probably could have done it in real time, I was, uh, you know, I, I live in a house with a family, so uh, kids were in and out of it, so there's a few gaps. Uh, but let me know what you thought in the comments. If you've tried it, uh, tweet me your pictures. That would be really cool to see. I have noticed that Rennie Ritchie has done it as well, and uh, he did a much better job than me. Next up, Apple supplier Rockley Photonics unveils health tracking tech likely to come to Apple Watch. So this is a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about in the past, the uh, blood glucose monitor, blood alcohol monitor, um, heart rate, and a whole bunch of other stuff uh, that Rockley's sensor measures using spectrophotometers, which can detect and monitor a much wider range of biomarkers to dramatically increase the functionality of wearable devices. The sensor generates lasers to non-invasively probe beneath the skin and analyze blood, interstitial fluids, and layers of the dermis for specific constituents and physical phenomena. And that might sound quite complicated, and that's because it probably is. However, it's basically using laser light to basically work out how different things within your skin, under your skin, in your blood, in the liquids, in the uh, in the fat, in the fatty tissues around your body, uh, what kind of light and wavelengths they reflect, and which bits they absorb, and then it can work out what's there. It's pretty clever, um, but yeah. Looking forward to this stuff coming to the Apple Watch. I don't think it's going to be this year, but maybe Timmy's going to surprise us. But let's get into the questions for this week, starting off with Team Kinetics. Do you have any tips or suggestions to maintain battery health? My iPhone Pro Max was bought in February and the battery health is 98%. I plan a three year upgrade cycle, so I want the battery to keep up with me. I use optimized charging overnight most nights and I also use CarPlay for every journey and this requires the phone to be plugged in and is therefore charging. I'm worried that I'm charging it too much. Now if you do go over to Facebook at any point uh, you will find any of the Apple groups over there are basically filled with exactly this question. Um, my my battery uh, health has dropped by 1% um, over the past year. What am I doing wrong? How on earth can I uh, fix this? And uh, the rest of the group will happily teach you all the rain dancers that you need, uh, all of the magic, all of that stuff. It Honestly, it's not something that you really need to be concerned about. If you've got the efficiency charging modes, uh, the optimized charging modes pl uh, switched on, that's a great start. Uh, the one thing I would probably guess, though, is that uh, if... If you're finding that it's dropping a little bit, I'm going to say that you're probably using a faster charger than you need to. If you're mainly charging overnight, then you shouldn't need to use a particularly fast charger. So if you're using one of the 20 watts, um, I would say that that's possibly the issue, especially if you're doing wired charging. Um, there were a lot of people asking about if the heat from using the wireless uh, MagSafe chargers caused an issue. Now, I've had mine since, uh, I think it was the beginning of November when they first arrived. Um, and mine's on 99% up until I think about two or three weeks ago. I'm sure it was 100% still. Uh, and I pretty much exclusively MagSafe charged mine. Now, it does warm it up a little bit more because there is some wasted heat. But, but it gets warm not because the batteries are being charged too fast, but because the surrounding areas are kind of heating from some of the, uh, from the wireless energy. So that shouldn't be causing any issues with the batteries. And because it has to charge a little bit slower with MagSafe, I think that's probably what's helping to preserve my battery. But I'm sure there's uh, going to be a lot of um, advice in the comments section. 
So fire away. If you've got some magic way of charging your batteries to keep them healthy, let us know. Next up, Idiot with Internet asks, I gave answered it'd be so cool if they called the Apple Mac Silicon Mac Pro the Power Mac M1 or M2, considering they're making coloured iMacs again and seemingly being more ambitious. Maybe not completely out of the question. Thoughts? Well, regular viewers to the show will be aware that we've in fact brought this up before because I mentioned I wonder if they will bring, uh, when, when we first heard that there were going to be colours coming back um, to the iMac, I wondered if we were also going to get iBook name coming back. It doesn't look like that's going to be the case, but I would be really pleased if they brought back some of these older names. Power Mac seems to make a lot more sense. Uh, I think, especially if you've got Mac Pro and iMac Pro, they sound very, very similar. But Power Mac, I would be 100% down for it. Do I think they're going to do it? Probably not. Um, I, the argument is that they were named Power something because they were Power PC chips. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the case because the Intel ones weren't called Intel Mac or In Intermac or iMac. Hang on, no, we did have iMac, but that started with a power PC chip, so that doesn't count. James Apple asks, will Apple make three Macs as they did at the One More Thing event? 14-inch MacBook, 16-inch MacBook Pro, and the higher-end Mac Mini, I gave answers. So I think that's a very strong possibility that they could well do three Macs. However, they're not going to spend as long probably talking about the chips because they've already gone through what Apple Silicon is now. Um, the fact that it is going to be faster and more efficient. So they should be able to get through that stuff a little bit quicker. They will also probably obviously break down what the cores are and how it all works. But I do think we'll be getting uh, three Macs, but I don't know if they would count 14 inch and 16 inch as two of them. Hopefully it will be iMac, MacBook Pro and Mac Mini. Because we never think of it as being uh, the introduction of two new iPads when they introduce the new iPad Pro. We think of it as iPad Pro introduction, which comes in two sizes. Enrique Miranda asks, IK answers, why is nobody talking about the decline in performance that macOS Big Sur has brought to older machines? Even a 2017 MacBook Pro constantly overheats, using just one app like the browser, terrible battery life on older machines, drops frames per second on a lot of animations, and even the M1 Big Sur the Safari experience is garbage. Websites like Amazon and YouTube scrolling has been so bad, I've tested over five machines and it's all the same. Old or new, Big Sur has been garbage when it comes to that. On the M1 apps open super fast, but scrolling in browsers have been garbage, drops frames and stutters all the time, more visible in Safari. All of my testing has been done on fresh new installs, while Catalina or Mojave still buttery smooth. The smoothness of macOS is a big important factor for me as it's one of the reasons I use Macs to begin with. I was just wondering, thanks. Uh, don't know, haven't experienced that. Now I managed to force it onto a 2013 iMac and it, it was fine. Um, I've got it on an M1 over here and um, it's been really, really good. Uh, there's been no stuttering in Safari at all. Um, I've got it on my wife's MacBook Air with M1 and uh, there's, there's no stuttering. Uh, it's been absolutely rock solid, no problems at all, if I'm honest. So, um, don't know what to tell you. Let's open this up to the floor again. If you have had problems with Big Sur being a bit slower on older machines or on new machines, um, stuttering in Safari and things like that, do let us know down in the comments because uh, it's not something I've even heard anyone complain about until now. Next up, Rob Renmark Raw Viking asks, what a great name. These new Macs are awesome and a lot of people are editing 4K video on even the base models. Everybody is talking about the performance but nobody is talking about 10 gigabit Ethernet. To keep your Final Cut Pro library, for example, on a server for editing without speed issues. I know you can get a Thunderbolt adapter but I want it built in. What do you think about the future of 10 gigabit Ethernet? Another great question but uh, it must be pointed out that there is, in fact, um, 10 gigabit Ethernet, which you can get on the Mac Mini models. Uh, now, it is the only one. You can't get it on the iMac at the moment. I think probably because um, that will be coming with the larger iMac, with the iMac Pro, if you want to call it that. Um, but uh, certainly with the laptops, you can't because they're not thick enough to physically have an Ethernet port in them. So if you do want it, and remember that the people that do want it on a laptop, especially a thin and light, is going to be a very, very small sliver of the number of people that actually use these. 
just like the kind of numbers of people that might want, I don't know, an SD card reader, then uh, then that is what USB-C ports, what Thunderbolt ports are for, is the fact that you can put an adapter in there that has got enough speed and you can do it. Um, but I don't think it makes sense to put it in there for the less than 1% of people that would actually use a MacBook Pro or a MacBook Air as a wired Ethernet machine. But if you do need it and you need to do a little workstation, then the Mac Mini is your one. I think it costs $100 extra to get 10 gig Ethernet. But I would also say that Wi-Fi is probably going to catch up and maybe even get close to overtaking that in the not too distant future. RTCom asks, I gave answers, which of the M1X and M2 will have the better GPU performance for apps that require a strong GPU performance, e.g. motion graphics software. So if you're looking for raw balls to the wall performance, it is going to be the M1X for you. Um, right now, we do have really quite good graphics performance in the M1. We have an 8-core GPU in there, and it outperforms basically anything else that's uh, integrated graphics-wise and outperforms quite a lot of discrete graphics cards too, especially in the um, laptop arena. Uh, the performance is about equivalent, uh, if not slightly better than a NVIDIA 1050 Ti, which is pretty good for a laptop, especially a thin and light one that gets you more than 10 hours of battery life. But if what you're looking for is the most performance, the M1X is going to come with 16 and 32 core options. So you're going to have between two and four times the amount of GPU cores that we've got in the M1 right now. The M2 is more likely to have about between eight and 10, uh, probably 10 being the maximum, uh, nine being the binned chips. Um, so yeah, if you want the full on performance level, you want to go M1X. The Golden S asks, I cave answers, pizza or chicken? I feel like we've been through this. Um, if you put pizza or at the beginning of any question, pizza is going to be the answer. Pizza or chicken, pizza or hot dogs, pizza or burgers, pizza or uh, the new Mac Mini. Uh, I really like pizza. I really like pizza. Travis Smith asks, How much storage and RAM do you recommend for a new MacBook Pro as they can't be upgraded after purchase? Now, that's going to depend very much on what you want to do with your MacBook Pro. If you are buying your MacBook Pro in order to play iPad games that come, uh, you know, that you can install on an M1 Mac, uh, you're probably going to be okay with uh, 8 gigs. If you want to uh, edit a lot of 4K video or do a lot of music editing with multiple tracks and multiple virtual instruments, you're going to want to go up to that 16 gigs. However, if you were on a budget and you were looking for which should I upgrade, definitely go for the unified memory every time. Don't go for the storage because storage, you can hang stuff off the side. You can use cloud storage. However, you can't use cloud RAM and you can't stick extra RAM into a USB port. So that would be the way I would go. I would say as well, if I was buying this Mac Mini again, I would probably go for the upgraded RAM option. I went for the eight gigs. It's been fine uh, for everything that I've needed, but there have been a few occasions when you kind of go, oh, slowing down a little bit. And I think that is a RAM bottleneck at that point. Evan Rogers asks, now that Loki has finished up, what are your thoughts on this and the other two Marvel series so far this year? And I'm gonna qualify this as a Apple question, as an I gave answers question, because uh, Disney Plus was Apple's app of the year for Apple TV, so um, it's definitely relevant. Uh, I thought Loki was really good. Um, I think my favorite of the shows that they've done so far is uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, mainly because it was the most like watching a Marvel movie, but just kind of chopped up into parts. And I thought they were really uh, quite good about the issues that they kind of raised in the show. Now, this is going to be spoiler free for everything. Um, the only thing I would say with the Loki one is it's if you don't have a bit of a background in what's going on with the MCU, it's going to be very confusing. WandaVision and uh, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I think you could probably jump into as your first entry, um, whereas I think Loki needs a little bit more kind of background knowledge and understanding of what a multiverse might be, for example. However, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very well written. and I thought it was very funny in places and I thought Sylvie was great. But I would probably put it second. I really enjoyed and I've loved all of them, to be fair. So even putting one in third uh, is not you know, knocking it in any way. 
Uh, but I would probably go uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, WandaVision. Because I think WandaVision took a little while to get going. And that's it for today's show, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next show. Don't forget, if you've got a question to hashtag IKVanswers down in the comments section. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.